Good, good. Good morning, Good morning. and uh, welcome to our seminar this morning. I am holding this bag. Apparently it was left in the cafeteria this morning. Uh, does it belong to anybody here right now? All right, I will be giving it back to Rocky Davis, who will be giving it back to Elder Haley, who will take it to locating. So if it is anybody, that is where it will be, is at the locating. Well, welcome. Uh, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be here this morning. Thank you for the life-changing things that we're going to be hearing this morning. Be with our presenter, Hans Deal. Please help him, uh, give him the words to say, and uh, be with us as we listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So a couple things. Uh, you know Hans Deal. That's why you're here. And uh, he said he, he really needs no introduction because you all know him. That he's, he's been speaking here now. And, uh, but he did say that he feels lonely up here on the platform and he would like everybody to come down into this front section here because it would make him feel a lot better and uh, he'd, he'd get a little bit more company and be able to speak a little bit better. So if you can, come on down to the front and I know you'll be blessed this morning as you listen to him. So thank you very much and thank you for being here. Good morning. It's nice to see you on the move. Come a little closer. Let's make it like a family affair. Over the years, I have learned that you can give a very, even a brilliant lecture. And yet, when you ask people afterwards, did you enjoy the lecture? They said, oh, yes, it was very good. What did you like about it? Oh, it was very good. Anything in particular? Oh, it was outstanding. And I begin to realize People forget very easily and very fast. But I also learned when you tell them a story, they remember. And so this morning, I want to tell you a story that embeds some of the principles that we're trying to convey to you for your consideration. It was seven minutes before seven o'clock. And I knew that the people in the auditorium, some thousand people were of the Germanic origin. And what that means is when you have a German group of people, they're always very, very punctuality oriented. There's a compulsion there. They got to start on time. If you're one minute late, it's already over. So I knew I had to start on time. Seven minutes to go. I'm in the foyer of the auditorium, and I'm just about ready to go to the platform when somebody calls my name, Dr. Deal. We need to see you right now. I turn my back. I'm not available. I'm sorry. I need to be up there on the front in any minute now. Then the request comes even louder. Dr. Deal, we are Bob and Teresa Anderson. We need to see you right now. We drove seven hours to see you. Seven hours. They must be from Creston, that small town where I did my program six months ago. You mean they drove all the way to see me as alumni of our TRIP program? Then I have a loyalty. I have an issue here. I need to see them, but I cannot do it right now. What do I do? Thousand people waiting for me there? Do I take care of them, or do I take care of this couple there? What shall I do? 
I'm stuck. And then I have a bright idea. <laughs> I have that once in a while. And uh, I said, uh, Bob, uh, listen, uh, uh, would you be prepared to go with me to the platform and you tell the story that you were going to tell me to all the people? And they all would benefit from it. You know, you have to be very careful when you ask people to come on a stage with a thousand people. I mean, it's easier to, to die than to be in front of a thousand people. And this was said, yes, sir, I can do it. I was amazed. So we walk into the auditorium. It's one minute to seven o'clock. I'm on time. And the people are happy already. And then I say, I'm happy to introduce to you one of my friends, one of my graduates from the CHIP program. They drove seven hours to tell you what happened to them. And then I make my first mistake. I give him the mic. <laughs> Never give anybody a mic unless you know what they're going to say. Because his first words are, we drove seven hours to tell you, don't believe everything that this man is telling you. <laughs> and I begin to realize it was not such a bright idea to give him the mic. <laughs> and then as an encore, he says, this man cost us $30,000. And I was standing there in front of the people, <laughs> disrobed, without the clothes on. He had put me into a terrible situation. I tried to establish my credibility over the last three sessions. This was session number four of 16 sessions. And suddenly, I was standing there naked. It was a shocking experience for me. And then <laughs> he said to the people, now this is your fourth night here of the CHIP program? Yes, sir. I said, oh, I remember my fourth night. We were driving home. Now, what I should tell you is that when I talk about uh, health issues, when I give the CHIP program, the first three nights, I don't talk about diet. I don't talk about these issues. I talk about what is disease, what is atherosclerosis, what is heart disease, you know, what is diabetes, and so on. I give a basic understanding. I lay the foundation for the big lecture. Number four, this is the time, the fourth night, when I talk about disease, and diet. They're directly related. You see, I'm a gradualist. I don't pour it onto the people. I try to help people to become first familiar with me. I want them to understand that I respect them. I know that they cannot change from one, one day to the next. I understand that it takes time to digest these new mental concepts. Because I also know that when you make dietary changes, when you make changes in your exercise routines, you cannot dictate to people to do this. It has to come from within. It has to do with education. It has to do with learning and understanding. And they say, ah, I got it. I need to see if I can change my routines. I'm a gradualist. I give people time to think about these things and then let them decide rather than hammering these people over the head. And so he tells the people, I remember that fourth night. We're driving home. And my wife turns to me and she said, you know, honey, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I think it's time we make some changes. We need to do an extreme makeover. When we get home, I know what we need to do. Are you with me? Yes, sir. <laughs> the sergeant had spoken. They drive into the driveway. They get into the house. The first thing she says, now what about those Marlboro cigarettes, those favorite cigarettes, the cartons that you have? Oh, yes. They were already at the fireplace the marble cigarette cartons. And then she turns over the, the uh, mattress to him and says, Bob, it's time 
to do something. He takes the match, he lights the cigarettes, then he kneels in front of the fireplace and he takes a deep breath. <laughs> he takes it in all he can because he knows it's the last time that he enjoys the aroma of those Marlboro cigarettes that meant so much to him throughout the years. And then she turns to him and she says, Bob, here are these two 33-gallon olive green garbage bags. We're going to go down into the basement. We're going to fill them up. So they go to the basement, and she opens up the freezer, and uh, he says, no, I don't understand. Uh, he hasn't really said that much about uh, these kind of things here yet. Uh, oh, yes, 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 yes. He talked about it, and he stares at his favorite sirloin steak in that freezer, and he doesn't want to give it up. And he says, now look, he doesn't have said anything yet about this. And she said, oh, yes, he did. He said, if it has a face... If it has a mother, don't eat it too often. Oh. She opens up the garbage bag. The sirloin steak disappears. Then he looks at the next layer, and there's this chicken looking at him. And he thinks, huh, it's white meat. That must be okay. Does it have a mother? The chicken disappears. Then he feels the gun on his chest. His wife is telling him what to do. The sergeant is alive and ready to tell him what to do because now he looks at that fish. And you know, many people out there in the world think fish is okay. I mean, fish is, a fi is fine. I mean, you need fish oil, right? That's what people think. I'm talking about that later on. And she looks at him. He looks at the fish. And the fish looks at him. <laughs> and the fish disappears in the bag. And so it goes. The first freezer is emptied. The second one takes its place. It's being emptied. And what is left is only raspberries and some spinach and some blueberries and some strawberries. These are the things that are left there. And the two bags are full. And he thinks he is done. Oh, no. She's very clear. She said, now let's go up to the kitchen. And now she opens up the upper compartment of the, freeze, the refrigerator. And there he stares at his favorite ice cream. Oh, no. Hagen does. <laughs> He's willing to die for it. No, no, no. Mother has a face. Yeah. Yeah. Animal product. And there's another bag that she brings. 33-gallon olive green garbage bag. And the ice cream disappears. And more things disappear. And they all fall into this garbage bag. And then she moves it. She drags it over to the pantry. And there he looks at the shelves. And his favorite foods are there. The M&Ms and the Pringles. And it's all there. And he relaxes because they don't have a mother. They don't have a face. I'm okay at, at last. And she said, Bob, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Bob, you're in the hospital regularly. Bob, we need to make some changes. This is the night... It's time to make a change on board. And he looks at her and says, no mother, no face. And she said, he said, if it's refined food, if it's produced food, if it's manufactured food, don't eat it too often. Bob disappears in the bag. By the time they're done, the shelves are empty. Then they move to the wet bar. He's a builder. When he comes home, he enjoys his vodka. He enjoys his Marlboro cigarettes. And he goes to his favorite chair, the wet bar. And he says, no, look, no mother, no face. Bob, it's refined food, isn't it? No, he said, it's grains. It comes from grains. Grains are all right. 
But they're refined, aren't they? There's no nutritional value to these things here. It's empty calories. And he pours it down the drain. And I'm getting increasingly nervous because there are a thousand people there and this man is taking everything away from these people on the fourth night of the program. Let me do it. I'll be giving the lecture later on. I thought I would give him three, four minutes. He's already into 20 some minutes and he enjoys the mic and I'm stuck and I don't know what to do. <laughs> and then he tells the people, look, <laughs> he said, uh, uh, I had a shadow follow me everywhere I was going. The shadow was seven feet long and two and a half feet wide. And I knew I would be in that casket any time now because I was 66 and my father died at 62. It was coming. And then he tells the people, I remember, yeah, I've gained some weight. I'm 65 pounds overweight. I have arthritis in my spine. I can hardly stand and bend over properly anymore. I have arthritis. I am heart disease. Um, I'm in the hospital regularly. Uh, I'm a sick man. I remember my physician coming to my house uh, with his teenagers, and they unloaded the firewood for the winter season. This is Canada, okay, winter time. And I, it was my worst, my blackest day as an adult because I'm a self-made successful man. I'm a builder. I build large buildings. And now I had been forced to retire. And I feel that I can't even take care of my family. I can't even take care of my wood. I have to have my physician come and take care of me. I feel totally, yeah, I'm no longer a man. Depend on other people. And I'm beginning to pray. I said, Lord, Lord, send an earthquake or something to happen here. And the Lord says, no, 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 son, you don't understand. We're not in California. This is Canada. And I said, Lord, make a transformer blow so that microphone goes dead. I don't know how to get this microphone away from this man. He's taking my time. I need, this is the big lecture tonight that I have to give. Diet and disease. Lord, help me. And the Lord says, relax. It's my program. It's not yours. I'm in charge. You know, when it's all done, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. And Bob turns to his wife and he says, Hello, Teresa. Look, everything is in garbage bags. What are we going to have for breakfast tomorrow morning? That's a powerful question, and I pass it on to you. When you come home from camp meeting, take a look. What's in your freezers? What's in your refrigerator? What's on your shelves? Are these foods, as they come out of the hand of a master designer, foods as grown? Or are these engineered foods? taste sensations that addict you to these products so they can sell more. Think about this when you get home. And then he tells the people, you know, my angina, my chest pain was so bad, I couldn't even walk to my mailbox anymore to pick up my mail, which was 200 feet. I had to drive my old jalopy of a car to pick up my mail. It was terrible, but I didn't know what to do. Forced to retire. Now I'm getting my honey-do list every day from my wife. I'm a new boss. And uh, he said to the people, but we did all these things on the fourth night of the program while the other people all gradually move towards Dr. Deal's gradualist approach. And because of that, we had the best results. Our cholesterol was, the drops were bigger than anybody else. Our blood pressure were coming down. Our blood sugars were coming down. We were losing weight. We are the stars of the program because we started on night number four. 
but he never exercised because he had this back problem. But gradually, after the graduation, he said, maybe I should begin my walking program. He started walking five minutes and 10 minutes and 20 minutes and 30 minutes and 60 minutes, and he got tired of walking, and he said to his wife, we need to do something different. He called his son in California, who is a bicyclist, and he said, son, tell me, can a 66-year-old man that has never ridden a bike learn how to ride a bike? And the son says, Dad, are you talking about yourself? Yes, Dad, yes, I am. Dad, you can do it. But get yourself a titanium bike, 21 gears, with an altimeter, everything on it, and be sure you get those special gloves without fingers and get those leotards, because I remember you have some pretty hairy legs, Dad. It's too much wind resistance. Do it right. <laughs> yes, sir. And so he tells the people, so we drove down to the border, we crossed into the United States, and we found this bicycle shop, and uh, I found my titanium bike with altimeter, 21 gears, I found my special gloves, and then I went over to the area where they sell those leotards, and my wife looked at me and she said, you're going to go there? What are you going to do? You're going to wear those? We are, very, we are in a very conservative town. Look, if you want to wear those leotards, those fancy, sexy leotards, you're going to drive your bike at night when nobody sees you. <laughs> but he proved his manlyhood, and he bought it. They're driving home, and she turns to him and says, Bob, do you realize, do you realize you, you have just spent $2,000 for yourself? What about me? And he says, oh, you want to have a bike too? I get you those special leotards, and you can drive during the daytime. No, 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 no. She said, no, 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 I don't want this. What I really want, um, what I want, what I want, I want a piano. Folks, this is a, another big point of my presentation here today. Are you men listening right now? I mean, she said to him, you know, I don't want a bike, but I want a piano. And he thought to himself, she's crazy. She's 65 years of age. She, we have another piece of furniture to dust. Uh, she has never played the piano in her life. I'm not going to go for it. This is crazy. And he feels like telling her off. Men, are you listening? He was a very wise man. You know what he said? That's very interesting. That made all the difference. We think we have all the answers. That's very interesting. That means, tell me more. And then he says to her, um, does it have to be a grand piano? No, 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 an upright is fine. Does it have to be a, a new piano? No, 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 a used one is just fine. And then he says, and do you have any idea how much that would cost? And she says, yeah, about $1,500. And he thinks, ah, good thing. I spent $2,000 on myself. I get away with $1,500 for her. I'm ahead $500. <laughs> and then he says, anything else? Men, are you listening? <laughs> Talk to your wives. <laughs> and she says, yeah, you know, I need to have $500 more for the piano teacher. I'm taking lessons. <laughs> oh. I mean, do we have a piano teacher in town? Oh, yeah, I checked it all out. Oh. Do you see? Don't underestimate those ladies, men. So now, I began to add things up. $2,000 for the bike, $2,000 for the piano and the lessons, $4,000. But he talked about $30,000, didn't he? So what happened? Where did the other $26,000 come into play here now? And then he tells the people. He says, um, um, it was 7 o'clock in the morning. My wife is a diabetic. My wife is uh, 85 pounds overweight. You know, Diabetes and overweight, they always go together, especially 
as we get older. And uh, she uh, ma wakes him up at 7 o'clock. He looks at the watch and he says, 7 o'clock, Teresa, you always wake up at the crack of noon. What's happening? I mean, we are depressed when you are uh, dispirited, you know, and it's cold outside. You pull your sheets over you and you get up at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And he says, it's 7 o'clock in the morning. What's wrong? And she says, I've been thinking. Oh, <laughs> that's good. You've been thinking. What are you thinking about? Well, um, she said, Bob, you know, we are respectable people in this town. We have a good bank account. Why are we driving this old jalopy of a car? I'm so embarrassed. And he said, I don't understand. I've been trying to get a new car for some time now, for the last two years, and you've always sabotaged it. You always said, no, 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 no. The car will not take us there to see the neighbors and the friends and so on. Uh, we better stay at home. And Bob, didn't you get it? I didn't want anybody to see me. Because remember, I was gaining weight and weight. I'd become a ton, round, a well-rounded person. Bob, don't you realize I would give you a, a, a shopping uh, list every week and you would do all the shopping. I didn't want anybody to see me in our small little town. Bob, don't you understand? Obesity is very painful. Especially to women. Bob, did you never catch that? But Bob, look, it's now several months and Bob, I've lost two, three pounds a week. Bob, I'm a new person. Have you noticed? Hello, men. Are you listening? <laughs> Acknowledge some of these good things that our ladies are working on. Be complimentary. Not just about weight loss. Anything. Cooking. Doing the dishes. Help with the dishes. Do whatever you can. You are a team. I said, Bob, I lost this weight. Now I'm eager to get this new car. And I know once we have that new car, you want to show off. And you visit all the folks that we haven't seen in three years since I've gained so much weight. But Bob, I'm a new person now. I can do it now. We can do it. We're a team now. <clears throat> and then... He tells the people, you know, I began to feel so good. My angina diminished dramatically. I would see my cardiologist and I would tell him, I said, you know, I feel so much better. And uh, he put me on the treadmill and he said, yeah, you have really improved uh, your heart. Your cardiovascular system is much more effective and efficient now. Um, what are you going to do next? And he said, I want to drive to Ottawa, the capital, which is... Hello? Which is 3,200 kilometers, which is about 2,300 miles. You want it on a bike or on a car? Sir, I have a 21 gear bike. I can do it. And he said, well, why don't we give it another year and a half? And as you get more and more fit, I give you a treadmill test regularly and we'll see what happens. And if you are if you, well, doctor, I, I heard this doctor talk about you can reverse heart disease. They begin to open up again. Uh, doctor, well, that's a news to me. He said, uh, well, but they've done it in monkeys. They've done it in different animal species. I saw, I saw the lectures. I heard the lectures. The doctor, well, he said, okay, okay. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're not. Uh, we, can take the blood, we can take the blood test regularly, and we can do the treadmill test, and we see what happens to your heart. We can do it. If, you're, if you qualify, I'll let you do it. And he tells the people, I was now 68 years of age, two years since I attended CHIP. I'm on the program. I'm going to see if this doctor is right, if I can reverse my heart disease, if I can open up my arteries again. They were narrowed down to the extent that I had angina pain. And at 68, Bob Anderson hits the road. And as he starts his journey across Canada, 
His physician friend is there. My friend, Dr. Kettner, a Loma Linda School of Medicine graduate. And he's also the lay pastor of a small church in that little town of Creston. And he has 60 of his church members all there to say, Godspeed to Bob Anderson. And then uh, Dr. Kettner said, you know, there are days when you not feel wanting to get out of bed as you're traveling across the country. The Charlie horses, you feel tired. Um, but I want to give you, I want to entrust this little box to your care. It contains 60 love notes from my 60 members here. And they want you to open this box every morning when you don't feel like getting out of bed on that iron horse. And they want you to read one love note every morning. And they want you to know that their prayers accompany you on your journey. Bob Anderson becomes a national hero in Canada as he travels across Canada at the age of 68. His physician, his cardiologist, has given him a clean bill of health. He can do it, but be careful, they said. And the television cameras are there. They follow him, and they see him night after night, day after day, going from one city to the next. And the mayor is there to give him the keys, the golden keys to the city. They welcome him. His wife travels in the car that they bought for $26,000, remember? <laughs> right? Right? And she follows him to make sure that everything is going fine and they're just doing well. They arrive in the capital of Canada after 60 days of bicycling. And when he arrives, there's the Bicycle Club of Ottawa that greets him and they, as a team, drive up to Parliament Hill, and there is the Minister of Aging, there's the Minister of Health. They're all there, and there is an Adventist school choir that sings, Oh, when the saints come cycling in. <laughs> and he feels great. And then they ask him, Tell us, what were some of the challenges uh, on this trip? 60 days across Canada on a bike at 68 years of age. And he said, well, number one, when I traveled across the prairies, the flatland, the wind always came from the wrong direction, always into my face instead of supporting me. Number one. Number two. <clears throat> he said, I was thinking about the food, simple foods. I made it a really special effort to go to places where I could find foods as grown, simple foods. And he said, number three, I thought about these people that were praying for me and I couldn't let them down. And he said, I wanted to become an inspiration to the people of Canada. It's never too late to turn around. Here I am a heart disease patient, angina, severe arthritic pain on my, in my back, and yet I'm living the best life possible because I was willing to make the decision to turn things around. It was about time to do it. And everywhere he would go, um, he would distribute the science of the times because they had written an article on him already that he was going to travel across Canada and he was spreading the word that health is something that you accomplish and achieve. It's not given to you by luck very rarely ever. <clears throat> and there is Bob and there is his beloved sergeant wife, <laughs> Teresa. And then the phone calls came. 
And Bob called me up and he said, Dr. Dio, you know, I came into this world as an atheist, but it was the love of these people, those 60 people of the Adventist Church in Creston that softened my heart and I'm now ready to become a friend of Jesus. My baptism is coming up and I want you to pray for me. Another phone call comes in some years later and he says, Dr. Dio, I just finished building the house of my physician, Dr. Kettner. Remember, I used to be a builder and I couldn't do it because of my heart disease and my arthritic pain, but now I'm supervising building a new house for my physician, and of course the kids are doing the hard work, but I tell them what to do. I'm building again. I'm again in my profession that I love. It's never too late to turn around. There's only one real wealth in life, and that's your health. You can have all the money you want. You can be wealthy. You have nothing if you don't have the health to enjoy it. And so you see the turnaround of this man, Bob Anderson, from agnostic to believer. You know, here are some thoughts for us to think about today. In the desire of ages, where this outstanding biography of the life of Jesus. The author says, there are souls perplexed with doubt, burdened with infirmities, weak in faith, and unable to grasp the unseen. But a friend whom they can see and trust, coming to them in Christ's name, can be a connecting link to fasten that trembling faith about and upon Christ. We have a high calling. We have been saved to serve. But you cannot serve when you're sick. And so health comes into the equation and I equals O, that means input equals output. As you invest yourself, as you become serious about it. Oh, you say, well, I've heard all these things before, but you don't do them. I mean, we are praying over food at, at, at lunchtime, uh, at breakfast time, and you know that God cannot really honor these prayers because these are not foods that God made. These are industrialized products. These are animals that have to be slaughtered so that you can eat them. And you say, thank you, Lord, for giving me such a rich diet again so that I get sick. I mean, do you see where we are? Can't you make the connection somehow? And God is kind, and he just gently knocks. Won't you turn your life around? I know you say you can't do it. You're addicted. You're, you're yeah, I know you're depressed, and when you're depressed, you eat, and you're joyful, and when you're joyful, you eat, and you eat, and you eat, and you eat, and you go to potlucks, and you eat, and you eat, and you eat. Folks, and the Lord says, I understand. But why don't you turn your will over to me, and I will give you strength gradually more and more. Oh, yes, you will fall by the wayside. You, you, you fall off the wagon. It's okay. You're just making baby steps. You're just learning to become stronger. You're doing okay. You're not a failure. You're only a failure if you give up. And there's a knocking. The Spirit knocks again. You can do it. I'm by, by your side. You can do all things in my strength. All things. Yeah. Isn't it about time we make some decisions? Isn't it time we give some serious thought to a God who has created us and provided the food to sustain us as long as possible? He's given us two legs to walk every day. He's given us 
a comfortable home so we can get our eight hours of sleep at night? Isn't it time to turn those televisions off at eight o'clock or nine o'clock or ten o'clock and go to bed and have a quiet moment with the Lord and review the day and say, Lord, again, you're an amazing God. I couldn't find my keys, but I said, Lord, open my eyes so I can see them. And suddenly, there I see them all of a sudden. Don't you have those experiences all over the place? And you say, well, these are just coincidences. No, there is a God who cares about us. It's time we recognize him, who he is, a loving, caring God who cares about each one of us every day, every moment. Even about trivia. <clears throat> And then another call comes in. Teresa calls. Dr. Deal, Bob just passed away. But before he passed away, he said, be sure you call Hans. And I thought maybe they let me inherit the titanium 21-year bike. <laughs> And he said, she said, and Bob said, be sure you tell Dr. Deal, tell Hans, because of Chip, because of the decisions that I made to turn my life over to God as my creator God and my sustainer and my friend and to foods as grown and to become a nicer person and to live the Christian life. Because of that, we have added 20 years to my life from 66 to 86. And you know, he said to his wife, when she related to me, of these 20 years, 18 of these years were good years. And Gina, gone. Athletic pain dramatically diminished. Weight down, 65 pounds lighter. 16, 18 of these 20 extra years were good, healthy years. That's what we want for you. Remember, that's what I said to you the other day. We, I want you to die younger as late as possible. You don't want to live longer and be sick for the last 5, 10, 15 years. You want to be in good health with clear minds, as clear as they can be. And you want to be of service to people. And you want to focus away from yourself to others. What can I do? Oh, it's a wonderful life. When you see yourself giving away more and more to enrich other people, to give away your time, your energy. Those things are at home piling up. You don't need those anymore. Clean house. It's time to make some decisions. For Bob, it was from here to eternity because he said to Teresa, be sure you tell Hans, I'm looking for him in the morning. <clears throat> and there will be a loving God that says, welcome home. I've loved you with an everlasting love. You belong to me. Welcome home. <clears throat> what are some of the lessons that you perhaps pick up from the story? Be punctual, <laughs> right? I have a friend who was in the army, and he said to me, Hans, if you are on time, I was taught, you are late. My goodness. He was more German than these German people are. So be on time. Don't steal people's time. Plan, your, plan things well. Number two, I hope you picked up the idea. See what you have in your refrigerator in your freezers, on the shelves. Are these God's foods 
which represent nowadays in most American families only 14% of all the calories that we eat because most of the food that we eat nowadays is refined food, engineered food. It's not whole food, it's fast food. It's engineered food. Take a look what you have in your home on the shelves. When we would have our chip programs, we would have a little contest. After about uh, the first, the second week, we asked people, clean out the shelves, clean out the freezers, bring it right in here to the auditorium. And then we would have some accountants and they would write down how many pounds were brought in and that competition from one city to the next, to the next, to the next, where the chip program was running. And then someone came up with the idea and said, Sir, what are you doing with all these foods that are coming in here? Those Belgian chocolates and these M&Ms and these Pringles. What are you doing with all these foods? Oh, we give it to the, uh, we give it to the people in town here that are looking for something to eat. And they said, you're killing these people? I said, well, but they need the calories for right now. We'll clean them up later on. But get rid of these things. You don't need those things. Once you have them in the house, you cannot resist. You say, well, I'm so weak-willed. Of course you are. We're all weak-willed. Come to my home at Christmas time and I get a package from Germany with German goodies and delectables in there, something that I grew up with when I was a child. And guess what? I'm going to eat them. Well, of course, I eat them slowly, right? Because... So you get the idea? Do something about your exercise. I realized that the only way I could get my exercise in is if I do it early in the morning when there's no telephone messages, nobody's ringing me up. So that means that if I would get on the tracks at 6 o'clock in the morning when I go to the hills of Loma Linda at 6 o'clock in the morning for an hour, it also meant that I had to go to bed earlier at night, right? I had to reschedule myself because I wanted to get my eight hours of sleep. That meant I had to get at least into bed by 10 o'clock. That meant I had to make some adjustments in my television habits. Do you see how it all works? You have to develop a new routine. You have to do it very systematically. You have to plan it. And then it becomes part of your life and you feel so good. I mean, I feel really out of sink right now because I cannot walk the hills of Loma Linda right now. As a matter of fact, I usually have to be here at 7.30, uh, 8 o'clock to go over my slides and so on. And so, and I have to come here dressed up so I can't really walk outside in my running outfit. So that when I get back home, I'm trying to make up for lost time, right? Get back into the routine, and it makes you feel so good. You feel alive, you feel well. You feel on top of the world. Isn't that what you want? Isn't it time to make a decision? The time is now. <clears throat> Do you remember the song that we used to sing in the morning here? Is Heather here? Heather, I think we're ready for our final song. But before we do this, take one more look. But the same very special author who wrote the book, Ministry of Healing. And she wrote, listen, seek to restore the sick to health. This is true ministry, but you cannot minister when you are Sick yourself. It starts at home. It starts in your own body. It's time for you to begin to look at yourself and use intelligent self-care. Remember, the restoration of the body prepares the way for the restoration of the soul.
today, you can reach people out there to the message of health. And the message has to be delivered in our own bodies that model good health to them. And you say, well, I'm sorry, but I'm 85 pounds overweight. I guess I can't model for them yet. It's okay. Do your part. And as you reach out to other people, regardless of how you look, it's okay. They will see you slimming down and they will say, my, what's happening? What are you doing? Well, I'm following a special program. I've made some new decisions. I think it was time to do it. Is it possible that the right arm of our message, the health message, that the right arm has dried up? It has shriveled up? Sometimes we even have severed it? Don't you think it's time to get the right arm reattached so we can reach the hearts of people that are looking for us? Jesus, number one, was a healer, number two, a teacher, and number three, a preacher. And he is coming soon. The signs are everywhere. He is coming soon, and never again must we part. Thank you, Heather, for being with us and for closing our program. Let's stand together as we sing our song. Jesus has promised he's coming soon and never again must we part. But to be ready to hear his call, I must live with all of my heart. Thank you, Heather, and thank you for accompanying us every day. Thank you. Shall we pray? Our Father, our Creator God, mighty, powerful, ready to assist us, to help us, to strengthen us, and to be by our sides. We're going to turn over our lives to you and let the Holy Spirit reign because of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Tomorrow, we're going to have a special message about the health message. I'll give you the history of the health message that started in 1863. You'll be amazed. You'll be absolutely amazed how God has led us. It's time for the shriveled right arm to be reattached. We'll see you tomorrow morning. And this afternoon, I'm going to talk about reversing heart disease. Open up these arteries again. Not just the arteries to the heart, but to the mind, to the eyes, to the ears, to the kidneys, to every organ in the body. You want to be here today at 1.30, on time. And please come and join us in the first 10 rows here. Okay? Thank you. <laughs>